Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Jackson Crawford. In this video, on my Patreon-supported channel full of more than 600 videos about Norse mythology, language, runes, Viking sagas, etc., I am going to give you a quick intro to or about the saga of the Inglings, or Inglinga saga, an important source of Norse myth attributed like the prose edda to Snorri Sturluson, but not particularly well known, in fact, even less well known than this prose edda. I'm not going to retell it, obviously. Um, here, I just really want to tell you about what it is and point you to where you can get some of the stories from it on my channel. So Inglinga Saga is actually a phenomenally influential work in terms of how we understand Norse mythology today and what the popular understanding of stories about the Asir gods such as Odin, Thor, Loki, etc. are. But just about no one reads it, partially because uh, it is part of a very long compendium of sagas about the history of the kings of Norway called Heimskringla. And translations of Heimskringla tend to be inaccessible one way or the other. One way in the sense that you're not likely to just find it in idle search through a bookstore if anyone goes to those anymore or uh, you know searching like Viking books or Norse mythology books on Amazon. And inaccessible in the other way since the translations you can find are, as far as I know, uniformly in very archaic or otherwise weird English. The most recent and most commendable translation of Heimskringla is in three volumes from the Viking Society for Northern Research. I know that sounds funny, but it's a real serious scholarly society. By uh, Anthony Fox with translations of the poems by Alison Finlay. But even though they are recent and well-qualified translators. Their translation philosophy differs a lot from mine, including in that they generally follow Old Norse word order word for word, which is extremely alien to English-speaking readers. Uh, I understand from their introduction that part of their idea is they want to give you a sense of what it's like to read it in the original, but I don't think that's what most people want to read <laughs> these things for. I think they just want to know what it says. And if they want a sense of what it's like to read it in the original, they might as well learn Old Norse. Anyway, if you are looking for a translation, that one is free in a PDF format for the Viking Society for the Research, at least in April 2022. And uh, it is certainly admirably technically done. I just defer a lot in the translation philosophy. All right. Now, of course, by the way, I know, I realize it's sort of ironic that I'm saying that, you know, not that many people read Inglinga Saga. As, as if that many people will actually read the prose edda, but it is definitely even less. Now, when I uh, publish my translation of the prose edda with Hackett Publishing Company, it will include my translation of the Saga of the Inglings, because I think that it's just worth throwing in with it, because people see both of these quoted as, you know, quote-unquote, snorri, uh, but they have a harder time finding Inglinga Saga. But, of course, it'll be many years before that book is available. Uh, I ought to mention also that it's probably one of the biggest concerns people have when they see Snorri quoted as saying something that he says in Inglinga Saga is, well, that seems to contradict what he says in the Prose Edda, and the answer to that is yes. <laughs> he wrote these two books, Hamskringla regarded as a whole, and uh, the Prose Edda, for different purposes at different times, probably for different audiences. In a sense, you can think of the prose edda as having more of an Icelandic audience and Heimskringla as having more of a Norwegian audience, but that doesn't fully explain it. He wants to write the prose edda initially to explain to younger generations how to compose traditional Norse poetry. That is largely an Icelandic pursuit, and in Iceland uh, at the time, as evidenced by the very existence of the compilation of the Poetic Edda, at about the same time as Snorri was writing, uh, a fair amount of engagement still with uh, 
the original poetic source material of Norse myth, right? Someone was out there still retelling poems like Voluspa, as evidenced by the fact that we have it in the Codex Regis manuscript, we have it in a somewhat different version in the Hex Book manuscript, we have it quoted in a somewhat different version still in Snorri Sturluson's Prose Edda. So there's some fairly rich transmission of these original Norse myths going around. In Heimskringla, what he's doing is sucking up to the kings of Norway. And there's a lot of complicated political reasons about that related to Snorri Sturluson's life. But if we think of it as having more of a Norwegian audience, potentially that Norwegian audience also isn't as familiar with the original Norse mythical material anymore as well. But at any rate, Snorri also wants to justify the traditional hundreds of years old claim that the Norwegian kings are descended from the Vanir gods and yet also present the Vanir and the Asir gods as being just human beings that were misunderstood as gods. He consistently holds that line through the saga of the Inglings. But in the Prose Edda, while he starts off with a prologue where he says, well, you know, he actually sort of retells Genesis very briefly and then says that you know, men forgot God, some of the typical Noahite kind of stories uh, about, you know, people kind of wandering astray from God and forgetting his name in various different ways and places. And then um, he says that, well, up in the north, his own ancestors uh, misinterpreted some Trojans fleeing the Trojan War as gods. And so he has a bunch of uh, real stretch explanations of the Norse gods as being, in fact, heroes of the Trojan War, like he makes Thor Hector, and that's actually probably the best he does in terms of these names. All of that, while sometimes misinterpreted as being part of pre-Christian tradition, which opens up a lot of weird questions if you take it that way, um, is an invention of, if not Snorri, stories, Snorri's time, which was a time when medieval Christian scholars wanted to integrate uh, to the extent that they were preserving older traditions from their country or others, those traditions with biblical and classical history, right? We want to tell one cohesive story and we want it to be canon and not disagree with the Bible and uh, to the maximum extent possible, also uh, we wanted to agree with the classical literature of Greece and Rome. And there were a lot of people other than Snorri trying to portray their own particular people, whether those be British or Albanians or whatever, as the descendants of the Trojans. Because everyone knew who the Greeks were, but no one knew who the Trojans were anymore. Okay. So throughout the Saga of the Inglings, Snorri is portraying the gods as human beings, misinterpreted as gods. But he also kind of confusingly has them sort of start believing in themselves as gods in order to explain some old religious things. Like, for example, he is one of the, the, the gods, I believe it's Njorther, die, right, like as a human, but be marked with the sign of a weapon so that he can go to Odin after he dies. So Odin is both, <laughs> like, mostly a human being in the story, but then even the gods themselves seem to start thinking of themselves as gods. Because Snorri, of course, can't completely reconcile the poetic sources in Old Norse with his pretense that these are Trojan human beings. Now, Snorri also probably, and, you know, I don't think that anyone can say this for sure, and I think I might have even gone back and forth about this myself, but I would say probably, if you ask me today, 5149, maybe a little bit more than that, maybe 5248. Um, actually wrote the prose up before he wrote Heimskringla. Um, there's not great evidence one way or the other. In fact, technically, you could argue that there's no evidence that Snorri wrote, or there's no proof that Snorri wrote either. <laughs> right? Medieval authors didn't sign their work. Um, so we have just tradition in Iceland that these are the work of Snorri Sturluson. Probably correct tradition, but it's not you know, absolutely provable in the way that you can say, you know, Cormac McCarthy wrote All the Pretty Horses. All right. That's a that's a, a, a lot of intro about some of the differences between the Prosetta and Linga Saga. Let me give you a quick word from my friends and partners at Grimfrost. I'll come back and talk to you a little bit more about the Saga of the Inglings. Mm -hmm.
So why is it called the Saga of the Englings? Well, an Englinger, plural Englingar, is a member of the ancient dynasty of Swedish and Norwegian kings. So remember that Heimskringla is a chronological account of the history of the kings of Norway, starting at their very beginning, so with these quote-unquote Trojans, or the Norse gods, and then going through 1177, so basically right before Snorri's birth, uh, just a couple years before his birth. Um, so the Saga of the Inglings begins with uh, sort of a brief version of this Trojan story, well, after a brief description of the geography of the world, which is kind of interesting for what it shows about medieval Norse ideas about that. And then gets into uh, who the Norse gods are, again, treating them as human beings who are, or, who are ancestors of Norwegian kings. Occasionally, we get some straight up uh, mythy stuff, like we get a description of all the magic that Odin knows at great length, which in fact seems to be informed at, at least partially by the magic that Odin claims to know in the poem Hlavamal. And uh, we hear some versions of some mythical stories, like uh, a version of who Mimir is, right, the disembodied head that Odin uh, talks to, uh, that's actually completely different from the version that story that's in the prose in it. And probably one of the most influential things in Inglinga Saga, relative to modern day conceptions of Norse myth, is that it contains a, well, really the account of the war between the Asir and the Vanir. This has become a really popular part of the sort of, you know, all about Norse mythology books and websites today. But in fact, if we didn't have Inglinga Saga and we only had, say, the Poetica and the Prose Edda, we probably wouldn't make that much of the war between them. The war as it is described in Inglinga Saga is way more elaborate than it's ever described anywhere else. I mean, compare the way that he describes it in Skoldskaffermal and the Prose Edda. Much shorter story. A uh, much simpler story and ends very differently, right? So it's the Skaldskaparmal prose at a version that Snorri tells uh, that ends with the gods blending their spit and making Kvasir out of it, and this leads to the Othorir story. It's a very different story in Inglinga Saga, uh, less mythy and more sort of pseudo historical, including in the way that it uses the river Tanais, which was the, uh, the traditional classical uh, dividing line between Europe and Asia, as the origin of the name Vanir which, by the way, is not etymologically sound. Um, so that's, that's really a figment of Inglinga Saga that I'm not extremely confident about uh, as reflecting, say, mainstream, or, quote, canon uh, uh, Norse belief in, say, the, the late 900s, early 1000s when the conversion to Christianity occurred. Uh, I have made some videos about this. Question in particular, I'll mention one I made called Snorri versus Snorri, which is largely about contradictions between Inglinga Saga and the Prose Edda, or sometimes between you know, the Prose Edda and the Prose Edda, or Inglinga Saga and Inglinga Saga. And uh, uh, one that I made a pretty long time ago about the Vanir, where I talk about exactly what Snorri says in Inglinga Saga about the Vanir. Curiously, one of the little bits of evidence that uh, Hamstringa, or Inglinga Saga specifically, was written after the Prose Edda is he seems to refer in Inglinga Saga very briefly to the frame story in the part of the Prose Edda called Gilvaginning, which is where most of the Norse myth is. Now in that frame story, if you've read the Prose Edda through, uh, what happens is this king called Gilvi comes to the hall of the Asir, who are, again, kind of half-heartedly presented in the Prose Edda as, as human tricksters, and um, asks uh, Odin, in triplicate, high, just as high in the third, uh, questions about Norse myth, and Odin tells him, but he also deceives him with some illusions and tricks and stuff. Snorri seems to be referring to that here in Inglinga Saga when he says, En er Odin spurði at góðir lands kostir voru eustr at gulva, for han þanug og gerðu þeir gulvi sætt sína því at gulvi þóttusk, þóttusk engi kraft til hafa til mótstóðu við asana. Mart Otsusk there Odin vid, or Gulvi i Brogdum oxion hervingum, or Urdu Asir Yavnan Rikri. But when Odin learned that there were good choices of land, right, good places to, to own, eastwards at Gilfi's kingdom, 
uh, he went that way and he and Gilby uh, made peace because Gilby uh, considered himself to have no strength for standing against the Asher gods. And uh, they, Odin and Gilby, they uh, competed in tricks and illusions, Brogdom, Oxion, Huervingu, and the Asher gods were always the more powerful, so they were always more tricky and illusory than Gilby himself. That uh, story about Gilby being tricked by the Asir is not known elsewhere other than in that frame story that Snorri uh, writes it into in the prose edda. So either, I mean of course that doesn't prove either that Hamstring was written after the prose edda, only that he's got the idea for the story, or even that it is based on some traditional story uh, elsewhere that, that we've lost except in Snorri's prose edda. You see how difficult these source questions can be. And one reason why I don't bring Inglinga Saga up very much is because I feel like I have to qualify it so much. Right? If Inglinga Saga is the one source for a story, then well, it's our one source and I gotta go with it as far as it goes, maybe taking it with more of a grain of salt than I would something in the prose that are certainly the poetic item. But in cases where it contradicts or greatly embellishes a story that's in the poetic edda or the prose edda. I'm not very confident about Ingling Saga because of its very different purpose um, and Snorri's general commitment to keeping up his frame story about um, about the gods not even being gods. Um, but then, of course, not all of Ingling Saga is about the gods. It's also about the first generations of Norwegian kings. And some of that legendary material uh, it's pretty cool, and a lot of it is demonstrably based on, on much older poetry. Uh, so you have weird stories like the uh, king of Sweden who sacrifices all of his sons to lengthen his own life, uh, which is a uh, weird story, but very plausibly connected, of course, to uh, other stories in Norse myth, too. Well, I hope that gives you a sense of what Ingling Saga is, and uh, one day... Uh, but these things don't happen fast. Uh, I'll have a translation of it out that you can look at, which I hope will serve your purposes too. For now, if these videos do you any good, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon community or perhaps uh, looking at one of my books. And um, if nothing else, please know that from beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best. <sighs> Even when I'm a little sick. <laughs>